Matthew, Mark, Luke, chapter 10. Luke, chapter 10. Any guests in the house? Any first time here? Amen. Any first time here? I'm just looking around the building. Amen. Is it your first time? Has she been here before, Randy? I think she has. Yes. Jerry, Pam, good to have y'all back. I've missed y'all. Y'all give them a hand. Good to have them back in the house. <laughs> Sir, I want to say Steve. Is that right? Is that right? Now, you ought to see the miracle in all that. I met you last week, first time here, but you're a bearded wonder. Amen. And uh, I remembered your face there. So, Steve, good to have you and your family back. Luke chapter 10. Let's stand for the reading of God's Word if you can. In other words, are you comfortable? Amen. Luke chapter 10, starting with verse 25. I am going to go fast today. Some of you say, Pastor, you always preach fast. You ain't heard nothing yet. Amen. I have to move. I got a lot of material. I actually had somebody say to me, are you actually going to use Scripture when you preach? And I think, are you kidding me? I always use Scripture. I said, what are you listening for? And he said, the jokes. <laughs> Well, I'm sorry. I don't always have jokes. Amen. Sometimes things are a little bit funny. But uh, in Luke chapter 10, verse 25, on one occasion, an expert of the law, a lawyer, stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What's written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? Jesus speak it. He answered, well, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. Well, you've answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you'll live. Now, had, had he stopped there, it would have been fine. But no, he's got to keep pressing. You've answered correctly, Jesus said. Do it and you'll live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. When he fell into the hands of robbers, they stripped him of clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. When he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, who was also a religious leader, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him, bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to the inn, took care of him. The next day, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said. And when I return, when I return, when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three, the priest, the Levite, the Samaritan, do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? Now understand this. When he says neighbor, he's not talking about the one that lives next door. He's talking about a man. This Samaritan didn't live anywhere near this Jewish man, but yet he's called a neighbor. Which of the three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robber, the expert to the, in the law? The lawyer said the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Father, I thank you for your word. Your anointing is what we need today. All of us need it, Lord, to move through the hard places of life. I ask, Lord, your blessing upon, uh, upon the hearers to hear the word of God, our hearts to not just receive it, but to do it. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. amen. Come on, give God one more shout for you sit down. Amen. Those watching online, thanks for tuning in to HolyWild.tv. The Scripture says that this certain man went down. And, and, you know, we don't know why this man went down to Jericho. The fact he was meant, uh, it meant his back was turned to one place, his heart was toward another. Jerusalem's the center of worship. Jericho was actually considered a curse. Uh, if you don't understand it, in the Old Testament, one reason that Jericho was destroyed is they would take the babies they would take babies and mix them in the mortar of the city gates. In the death of those children, that was the way that they would worship their gods. And so when they came into the promised land, Jericho was the first city to fall because of the way they dealt with their babies. Hmm, come on, Jesus. Amen. So we don't know why this man went down, but the Scripture says he turned his back away from, I'll say, the presence of God, headed toward a dark place. Amen. He's lured there. It's a place the road between was a steady decline, 18 winding miles that led to the Dead Sea. Now, I can tell you as a biker, when I can see that we got 18 miles of winding road, I get excited. Amen. Because I love the curves. I love to make that. But to imagine making that walk down this perilous place, 
uh, as he's moving down. It's a great place for robbers to hide. He's moving toward the Dead Sea. It was a, the natural resources that went into the Dead Sea stayed there, the point of no return. Amen. Many times in our life, if you're not careful, you become like the Dead Sea. Everything enters, nothing exits. When that happens, you, uh, you know, and I don't mean this to be comical, but it's spiritual constipation. You got problems. Amen. God blessed you so you can be a blessing. He wants to pour things through you. If he can get it through you, he can get it to you. So it's important to understand that all the blessings need to keep on flowing. I believe we are at a moment when our nation is deeply divided. It doesn't take a, a, a pro prophetic unction to even see that. We disagree with each other. The pandemic has exposed many of us, our fear of living, businesses and churches closed, many cocooned. We stopped reaching for people. We just, we pulled ourselves in, we quit reaching out. And across the political spectrum, we are beginning to realize that what is wrong with America is spiritual. And I think people are beginning to see that. It is going to take more than money to rebuild our cities, to rebuild our homes, our businesses. Amen. We, we need more Jesus. I've been saying more Jesus lately. Everybody say more Jesus. I just need more Jesus. Hallelujah. And we also need a birth of compassion. I'm mowing grass this week, and it hits me. I mean, it just poured all over me. Compassion defined is to suffer with another person. The word has a strong personal element. Webster Dictionary called it painful sympathy. Now, years ago, I preached out of this, this thought, but it hit me again this week that the miracles of Jesus not only had faith involved, they had compassion involved. And I asked God, why is it sometimes I pray for people, and I don't see the results I'm looking? He said, well, you're just being obedient. You're just praying for people people because that's what you think I want you to do. What I want you to do is have a heart for people that is suffering and hurting. And when you do that, you add faith to it. And my goodness, watch the miracles and the healing take place. Last night, Travis, when I was there, and I, I don't know the, the young man, he was sitting there with a DJ. His name was Josh. And I, I asked him his name. Didn't, he had a beard, you know, and I don't know what it is about beards. I, I really want one. I can't get one. So I just kind of hang out with guys hoping reciprocal that I'll start really growing a nice, uh, um, one of them Louisiana Monroe guys, you know, Duck Dynasty. I just, wouldn't it be cool? This just would be cool. But this is as good as I can get, and, and I've just barely outgrown my mother. So, anyway, <laughs> the, 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 the thing is, is I, I, I saw him, and I, 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 said, I got talking with him because I didn't know him. And when he stood up, I saw him grimace in pain. He got up, and I saw him hurting. And all of a sudden, my heart went out to him because that's how I feel at times. If I, if my leg hurts, my knee hurts, my, my, my hip hurts. And when he got up, compassion just went all over me to pray for this young man. I didn't know him. I just want to pray for him. because I, And I've often used the term the fellowship of pain. Amen. You hurt with those who hurt the way you hurt. Amen. If you've ever been addicted to something and you've broken that addiction, all of a sudden you want to help other people that have been involved with uh, addiction. Amen. It's just, it's just something about it, the cancer or, or diabetes or whatever it is. It, it's just something about that that, that we go through in life. And it, and it, it kind of tends to me, as I start getting older, I find out older folk uh, hang out with older folk. <laughs> I like the young folk, amen. It just helps me. It just helps me feel a little younger when I'm around them. That's why I love the ranch. It gives you an opportunity for that. But we need a new birth of compassion. When, when Webster talked about this, he called it painful sympathy, amen. So I realized that faith plus compassion brings healing into our heart. Our hearts break over. And they, they're still breaking over the last 14 months. We've lost loved ones. We weren't able to visit before they passed. Even there were laws against us going and touching them and hugging them and holding them and crying with them. I'm staring through a window at friends that I love and I'm waving at them and I'm praying for them, but I can't go in and touch them. Amen. That's anti-God to me. Amen. Because everything Jesus did had to do with compassion and reaching and touching people. It's an illustration here. When you remember the prodigal son, when the prodigal son took all of his, what his dad's inheritance toward him, he went out, he spent it on riotous living. Amen. Luke chapter 15 verse 20 talks about when he hit the low place in life, he came back. His father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And as a dad with kids that sometimes don't always do right, amen, my heart moves. I get mad. Dad, yes. I want to kick some butt. Yes. Amen. Can I be honest? I guess I was. But there comes a time in my life where just compassion overwhelms me, and I realize, God, you put me in their life for a reason. 
Amen. Hell, it is painful. I feel it. I hurt for it. And I want to be able to reach toward them. So it's more than feeling sorry for people in trouble. Biblical compassion means you see the problem. You're moved by the need. You go out where the problem is. And you get your hands dirty trying to help one person after another get their problem solved and raise them up to a higher level of life. I call it reciprocation. If I can pour into their life, I'm looking for it to come back. Now hear me. Sometimes life becomes about attachments. I don't always like attachments. Again, I talked with my pastor this morning. He said, you know what? I'm tired of pouring my life into people that don't reciprocate back. They keep asking you for over and over and over and over, but it never comes back in your life. Give it a little time. First, everybody needs a hand up. And when you give them a hand up and they start doing well and they reciprocate back in your life and you see that love come back and compassion come back, those are the people you keep helping. But attachments, beware of them. I've often said that attachments will suck the life out of you. You think they're eureka, but they're going to turn out to be a dirt devil. Come on, give me an amen. They just, every time you're around them, you see them coming, you you can hear it sucking. And you say, dear God, Jesus, help me. Hey, man, you just want to push away from it. And if, and if you've ever felt like that, and I have had to have help up at times in my life, but I reminded myself who it was that did it for me. So then later I was able to reciprocate back, pour back into life. Hey, Amen. And if not, make sure I help somebody else. That's what is so important. So when I read about the father, he had compassion on his son, embraced him, kissed him. You remember what happened after he killed the fatted calf? They had a party. Amen. He was lost. Now he's found. He even rebuked the other brother who was mad about it. Sometimes you get that elder brother spirit. You know what I'm talking about? Don't look around. Just look at me. But you get that spirit about you where you, you're upset because somebody else is blessed when you've always been doing right. Amen. Well, God love you. Amen. All I can tell you is you need to rejoice with those who are coming back home. Amen. That's why I love when folk come back through the house doors. Can I get an amen? Such a powerful thing. Hallelujah. Fish and bread. Matthew 14, 14. Tells us a little story. You know the story. Amen. When Jesus landed and saw large crowds, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. So what he asked for, he said, these people here, they're hungry. So you got, what, two, two fish, five loaves of bread, a little sack lunch. What are these among so many? And he feeds 5,000 men plus women and children. Let me help you a little bit more. He did it twice. He did it twice. Same book, Matthew, just a few chapters later. What, what was it moved him about these people that are hungry? It was painful sympathy. Amen. Then it happened again, Matthew chapter 15, verse 29. Just a few chapters later, Jesus left there, went along the Sea of Galilee when he went up to the mountain, and he said, Great crowds came to him, bringing the lame. They brought the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others. And they laid them at his feet and he healed them. I believe that these people saw what happened a few chapters before. Amen. And they realized that Jesus was a healer. And they began to bring people to him. Jesus called his disciples to them and said, I have, what's the word? Compassion. I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days, have nothing to eat. I do not want to send them away hungry, or they may collapse in the way. His disciples said, where could we get enough bread in this remote place to feed such a crowd? How many loaves? Here comes the question. How many loaves do you have? Jesus asked. Seven, they replied, and a few small fish. These might have been left over from the first group. You remember the first group, they got 12 basketfuls left over because there's 12 disciples that got in the boat, on the boat. You remember then what happened? The storm came up, started rocking. They screamed out, Lord, help. Come on, help me. Think about your Bible here. Lord, help. Amen. Jesus gets up. Peace be still. Now they're on the other side. Get on the other side. What do you got? 4,000 men plus women and children show up. So here they are. Amen. He takes seven loaves and the fish, and when he had given thanks, he broke them and gave them to the disciples, and they in turn to the people. If you've been with me a long time, you can say this with me. He broke the fish in half, and the head grew up, and the tail grew up. See, I love that. I'm going to be dead and gone. You're going to remember heads and tails real quick. Amen. Just flip the coin and pick one. Hallelujah. But they began to grow. They, they passed it out. The disciples were involved with the miracle. They all ate, were satisfied. After the disciples picked up seven basketfuls and broken pieces that were left over. God wants nothing left over. The number of those who ate were 4,000 men besides women and children. And after Jesus had sent the crowd away, he got into the boat and went to the vicinity of, of the Magdalene. Amen. Jesus felt the same compassion 
For the 5,000 men plus women and children, as he did for 4,000 men plus women and children. Amen. Compassion moved him. Compassion had him feed them and heal them. Compassion's a powerful thing. It is the thing I think we have, we're lacking. I, like you, can become so calloused over the needs that just keep on coming. And it gets, it gets worrisome. Therefore, you've got to ask God. That, that one song, that last song we sang, it, it, it's your presence. Remind me. Uh, uh, Tony, I forgot the words to it here. I'm be aware of your presence. Help me be aware of your presence. I just want to be aware of it. So when there's certain people that are around, I know this is the ones you want me to help. Matthew chapter 20, verse 29, tells us that Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jericho. Uh, again, somebody said, Pastor, you don't lose your scripture. Well, get ready. As Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him. Two blind men were sitting by the roadside. And when they heard that Jesus was going by, they shouted, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. The crowd rebuked them, told them to be quiet. And they shouted all the louder, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. Have you ever told somebody to get quiet and they got louder? Mm -hmm. Your kids? Okay. Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. Jesus stopped and called them, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, they answered, we want our sight. Jesus had, say it, church, had compassion on them, touched their eyes, and immediately they received their sight and followed him. What is it? It's that sympathy, painful sympathy he felt for them. He was filled with compassion, healed them on the spot. There was something about that moment. Then in Mark chapter 1, verse 40, a man with leprosy came to him, begged him on his knees, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Filled with, say it, church. Amen. Amen. Jesus said, be clean immediately. The Matter of fact, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean immediately. The leprosy left him and he was cured. Here it is again. Leprosy, you had to quarantine lepers. You had to put them on an island. You had to keep them away. They had to stay unclean. And Jesus walked in the midst of them and touched him. Touched him. Jesus, you don't understand. That leprosy can get on you. He touched him. And again, the word is compassion. To have a heart for people to reach back out and touch him. I, I am, uh, I'm past exhausted about what's happened over the last 14 months. But I'm going to say this to you. Have faith in God. Have compassion toward people. And don't be afraid to touch them. Don't be afraid to connect with them. Don't be afraid to put your arm around them. Amen. You know, my mother got into a place where she was a little bit nervous about it. And finally it was to, to the point where, you know what? If I die, I just still want to hug my son. Amen. And then we got back around each other again. There, there's something about this. I know there's common sense involved. But my God, they keep moving the goalpost. They didn't, they're not just moving the goalpost. They turn the thing sideways. You can't even kick through it anymore. Amen. It's just got weirder. Makes no sense. Hallelujah. But okay. I'm sorry. I've quit watching the news a long time ago, so I don't really know what's the most shocking part of this text is he touched him. In doing that, he broke the customs and the rules of the day. According to the Old Testament, you had leprosy, you unclean people, so scared of lepers, they made them live in a colony. But when Jesus saw the man with leprosy, he was moved because the man asked for something. Amen. He, he asked for healing. He asked to be made clean again. Hallelujah. Amen. He reached out and touched him. For our Lord Jesus, compassion is not a feeling. It was a commitment to get involved with hurting people. Real compassion is more than a feeling. Amen. It moves you into action. Acts chapter 10, verse 38. And I'll start closing here somewhere around here. Yeah, just heads up. Acts 10, 38. One sentence. One sentence. Summarize the ministry of Jesus. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. How many of you can tell me that God is with you? Lift your hand. You know God's with you. You know the Scripture says it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. God is with Emmanuel, God with us. So here I'm reading this scripture, and I can say to myself that Tommy went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Randy went around doing good, amen, and, and doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. David! Hello, David. Welcome back from Colorado Springs, sir. 
Went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Pastor, don't put my name in there. <laughs> don't put, all right, that, makes, that puts pressure on me. See, guys, listen. Whooping the devil and healing is not my, I can't do it, but God can. All I got to do is give him opportunity. So if I pray and they're healed, thank you, Jesus. I pray and they're not, prayerfully the next guy get them. Amen. But don't give up. And then whoop the devil. Stay on it. So when I'm reading this, it just jumps all over me. This one sentence summarizes that it was compassion. Amen. It moved him. He went about doing good. And people are so afraid. So afraid to be called do-gooders, Frank. You're such a do-gooder. Did you know that Jesus was the original do-gooder? He was always doing good. Now, I know some rascals out there that seem to have a hard time doing anything good. Amen. But I'm telling you, God called all of us to do good. Can I get an amen? Amen. So the question goes back is, who's my neighbor? Who's my neighbor? In one sense, the question ought to answer itself. Just look around. Your neighbor's all around you. They live on your street. They go to the school with you. They shop at the same stores, eat the same restaurants. You, you drive those same uh, neighborhoods with them. You work with your neighbors. You see them when you go to church. Your neighbors are all around you. They're all around you. Simple answer, so it would seem, but, but buried within it is a deeper theological question. In Leviticus chapter 19, 18, it adds the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Whoo! I got up, I showered, I fixed my hair, brushed my teeth, I shaved what little I had up here. Took care of myself. Love me. Oh, love me. I dress me. Put on my boots. Mm. Love me. Put me a little, uh, what's that stuff you use on your knee that you got me that, that, that starts with V, V, no. Something like bile freeze, but it don't burn. <laughs> Marie told me about it. And then I put my, my bandage over my knee there, my, my wrap, you know, so I can keep moving. I love me. I love me. I'm wild about myself. Now, I ain't as happy with my neighbors. I'm not talking about Sandy and them. I love them. I'm just talking about the other neighbors that flip me off when I go down the road. <laughs> You're laughing. It happens. I get out of that truck. I'll catch them. I'll chew them out real good and love them. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh-huh. You see what I'm saying? Jesus gives us this level, and he throws in the word Samaritan. Hmm. Jesus said there was once a man on, on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. Thieves fell upon him, beat him, stripped him, robbed him, left him half dead. And before too long, a priest, a minister of God, came by, saw the poor man lying there. And the priest walked on the other side. He wouldn't have to get involved. He had to get to the temple. A few minutes later, Levi came by a theologian, doctor of theology, a student of God's word. A man was supposed to know the character of God. When the Levite saw the poor man lying by the side of the road, he crossed to the other side so he wouldn't have to be bothered with him. He was already late for his weekly Torah discussion group. The robbers beat him, left him half dead. Amen. They stopped his downward momentum many, many years ago. I'm thinking 15, 16 years ago. I preached a sermon called Thank God for Robbers because it was the robbers that stopped me from going down. Amen. I mean, they stopped my downward spiral. Many times you get upset over the bad things that happened to you, but what it did, it brought you back toward God. Amen. Whether it was a sickness, whether it was a relational issue, a financial issue, but whatever it was, it forced you, God help me, to cry out to him. And on that way, a priest went by. Didn't help. You know, the opposite of love is not hate. It's apathy. It's not caring. The Levite did the same, passed by on the other side. He was too conservative to stop by and show any compassion. He walked on the other side. By the way, guys, to offer only curious concern only adds insult to the pain of an injured brother or sister. Where's your phone? Throw me your phone. You and Tony in a fight? Y'all fighting right now. Bob, you in a fight? You're fighting right now. Ken, don't you hit her. <laughs> see, you, you want to see something that upsets me? It's people that would rather take a video of a fight, uh, of, of an accident, 
or somebody hurt or one man killing another man and not get involved in it. You, you are accomplice to the crime that was just committed because you videoed it. That's as bad as if you do. Maybe not as bad, but it's bad. Because instead of getting involved, I'll just take a video, post it, and become popular. What I should do is put my phone down and get up there and bust somebody's head or pull out my gun and say, get off of him. Get away from her. Quit doing what you're doing instead of trying to video it and become famous for 15 minutes. <laughs> to only offer curious concern only adds insult to the pain of the injured brother or sister. Put your phone up. Soon after that came a Samaritan. When Jesus says that, he was talking about a despised group. The Jews hated the Samaritans. They would never say anything good about them. But Jesus said this half-breed hated Samaritan, came along and saw that the poor man lying there, when he found out that he was still alive, he took his wine, poured it on his wounds, dressed his wounds, picked the man up, put him on his donkey, took him to the inn, paid the proprietor, stayed the night with the man, and the next morning took out money of his own pocket, gave it to the innkeeper, and said, if there's more, I'll settle the bill when I come back. Had I not stopped, I wouldn't be out of any money. Had I not stopped, I wouldn't be out of any problems. Had I not stopped, I, I, you know, I could just pass by this Jew who hates me because I'm a Samaritan. See, race issues have been going on. Ethnicity issues have been going on. They've been going on since the beginning of time. You've got to decide that we all have a need for compassion. Seen in the light, many of us have hesitated. After all, we've got things to do, places to go, people to see. I, I don't know who isn't busy. Everybody's busy. I call them up. You're just, I'm busy. 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 B-U-S-Y. Being under Satan's joke. Always busy. I have not been busy in 18 years. 18 years ago, I made up my mind I will quit being busy. I'm not going to be busy no more. I get a lot of stuff done. I, I'm, I'm very effective. Amen. I've been more effective than I was busy. Busy people make me nervous. If your house is too clean, you make me nervous. You convict me. I feel convicted when I go into clean houses. I go home and chew my wife out. That's not true. You know that's not true. Listen, we can't rescue every baby. We can't save every marriage. We can't help every person, every homeless person, every needy person. But if God puts somebody in your path, that's your neighbor. If they jumped in your path, go around them. <laughs> Y'all hear me? They certain folk will always jump in your path because they know you'll help them. But if God puts you in my path, I say at that moment, I have a divine appointment to help you, to light a candle in the darkness. So it's not a matter of, be, of busyness, nor is it a matter of preparation. I have found it is when I am doing something that normally somebody is in my path that needs help. I suppose one can argue that his background as an outcast made him more likely to respond to human need. Perhaps his Samaritan also knew that there was a time in his life when people pointed at him and called him dog. They looked at him and called him half-breed and looked at him and put him down. It wasn't his fault where the Samaritan was born. He was born a Samaritan. He didn't ask for it. He was born that way. But he was put down. And he found another man who had been put down. Been passed by. He saw the priest walk by him. The priest didn't stop him. Well, I watched the Levite walk by. The Levite didn't help him. Why wouldn't these Jewish guys help this Jewish guy here? They would cost too much for them. So I stopped by. All I have on me is some oil and wine. And you have wounds and I'll pour it on. I'll give you back your joy. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. And I'll take you to the end. You know, the end is a type of the church. The church has never been a theological center. The church is a hospital. It's a place where you come to get healed up. Amen. That's what this place is. That, that's why. Have you ever been in a hospital? Yeah, sure you have. If you're old enough, you've, got, you've had to go eventually. When I talk to you old folk, you'd always tell me about your surgeries. I know you've been there. Listen, listen. 
I've never been in a surgery. I've had several surgeries, and I've never been in a surgery where he rips a curtain open and invites everybody in the waiting room to come and watch. <laughs> Just tear the curtain open. I'm laying in there, and I've got some type of half garment on me. Why? For the life of me, I don't know why I've got to remove my fruit of the looms. So here I am in there getting foot surgery, and I've got to be N-U-D-E. Makes no sense. I wrestle over this. And he throws the curtain over and invites everybody in the waiting room to come in here and watch. That's not what God does. What God does when he heals people, he brings them into a private place. And he covers them. And he doesn't invite you in. He doesn't invite you in. He says, I, I got to take care of this one. This addiction without you knowing about it. I got to take care of this problem without you knowing about it. I got, I got to love on this person here. And yeah, they're in the hospital here with you, but I'm going to cover them and heal them. Amen. So when you see people, you don't always know what God's doing in their life, Jack. You don't know. I found out a long time ago. Get, don't put your phone up, girl. What did I tell you about the phone a while ago? Okay, you put in the scripture. Well, you aim it up there at him. <laughs> Should I get involved? Should have passed by. In two weeks from now, we're going to have a biker Sunday. We will have church here. We're going to honor those who have served in the military and passed here. But then out there, we're going to have the bikers show up. And we're going to feed them, look after them, and love them, and reach toward them. I'm looking for one that needs Jesus. I, I found this out a long time ago. One can change the world if I can just reach one. Just one. And I don't use that as a cop-out because we've always done better than just one. But to have compassion on people, to invite, to encourage. I, I don't, this thing's coming to an end. We're moving closer and closer to an end. So, to, to reach for them people. Them, them daddies y'all had there last night, guys. Amen. To get them back in the house. To believe God for them. Amen. We've always been a church. Hurricane Katrina, we helped. Hurricane uh, Imelda, we helped. Harvey, we helped. We, we reached toward people. We connected with people. We've done always the best we could. We've housed people. We rarely know what compassion will demand of us, which is why we ought not to be overly calculated, amen, before we get involved. Sometimes the help we give will be brief. Other times it will cost us. We don't know. But here's the thing. All of us know somebody that needs Jesus. Amen. And it's compassion. Remind yourself that you were going to hell at one time and God rescued you. Amen. How are you going to reach them? I've, uh, I've always, since I got born again, reminded myself where I came from. Amen. In so doing, I've had a heart for people that have addictions, uh, that, that, that struggle, that, that fight. Amen. And, and still, there's a fight going on inside me. There'll always be a fight going on inside me. Amen. I, I don't think that fight's ever going to die. It just seems so. It'll come, it'll get, Bob Dylan said, dead man, dead man, when will you arise? You know, there's a dead man you've been putting down since the day you got born again. But every now and then that dead man will come up. And you got to keep pushing him back down. You got to keep dealing with it. So we come to the end of the story that Jesus told, which actually ends in a question. Which of these were the true neighbor? Priest, Levite, Samaritan. He said, well, simply the man had mercy. Didn't say, you notice he didn't say Samaritan? He just said, you know, the one that had mercy. Well, him, yeah. Then he says, go thou and do likewise. So the end of this message today is go thou and do likewise. Watch what God's going to do this week. You messed up when you walked in here today. Uh-huh. And you messed up when you watched me online today. Because God will this week put somebody in your path. Beware. Did he put them in your path or did they jump in your path? Amen. You've got to discern which, but you're going to have an opportunity to help. And how many know at one time or another you were in somebody's path? I was in Randy and Bubba's path. Amen. And they reached and helped me. So I'll give you three quick things in closing about neighbors. First, pray aggressively. Amen. History tells us, and I love the prayer meeting goes on here on Tuesday nights. Thank you, H. 
He had a little surgery this week, so he's not here today. But thank you, HD, and all those that gather for prayer. James, it's so important. Amen. Annie, pr good to pray. So history tells us that it's the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous that prevails much. That when we get desperate, desperate, amen, God does stuff. Compassion, desperation. So you got to pray. You got to pray for those around you. Jesus told us to pray. Second, we need to be radically personal. Now, when I say radically personal, I'm not talking about grab your Bible, wave it in their face. But remind yourself to be personal with people. What's your name? How many that? That's a good one. What's your name? This is my name. Now, again, I saw a commercial that said, you do not have to let the waiter know your name. You know, you don't have to be like your daddy. But I, I always want to know the waiter's name and the waitress's name. Because I'm probably going to tip them at the end. I just want to know their name. Make it personal. Amen. Third, begin this week. So I'm asking God to give you and I the eyes of a missionary. Help us understand, Travis, that people without us ain't going to make it. We've got to reach toward them. Amen. Heads bowed, eyes closed for a moment. Those watching online, listen to me. I want you to be aggressive this week. Aggressive in the sense of ask God. Amen. Pray. Ask God, Lord, who is it I need to reach this week? Is it family? Is it friends? Is it an enemy? Is it somebody who's been against me? Is it somebody I can turn their life around by just doing something kind for them? I want to change my world. Not through programs. Lord, it doesn't even have to be preaching done at a distance. But one heart at a time. One life at a time. Give me compassion for people that are dying. For people that don't know you. Amen. Give me compassion for the hurting. Even for the saints that are hurting. Give me compassion for them. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Come on, give God praise in here.